just to get a feel of the room, we've, I know this is container camp, but how many people know what Kubernetes is? Great. How many people have actually spun up a cluster before? Sweet. How many did that on-prem? Wow. Lovely audience. How many people have been asked to raise their hands at a conference before? <laughs> Sweet. I want to get a lot of love here. Um, so I'm pretty new to Kubernetes. I joined the team about six months ago. Uh, and when I went to Kubernetes.io, I saw that page being the first setup page, which was titled Picking the Right Solution. This page lists 40 different solutions where you can host your own Kubernetes. 40 different solutions, everything ranging from managed to on-prem to open source to turnkey. What this does not include is the installers you will use on those solutions. These are just some of them which are open source. I'm sure some, some of you know COPS and Tectonic and have used them. Um, all they're trying to do is solve the same problem. How do you install Kubernetes and how do you manage Kubernetes? But sometimes these don't cut it, so people write their own. In the last talk, there was a bullet point um, that said we wrote our own cluster um, installer. That's exactly what a lot of big organizations do. They write their own installers, their own implementation of node pools, their own upgraders because you have constraints for networking and storage and so on. So what I'm getting at is there is no foundation right now to build higher level tooling from. But wait a minute, isn't there Cube Admin? How many people know what Cube Admin is? Cool. So if you've used Cube Admin, you know you SSH into your VM and you run Cube Admin in it, and then you, from your nodes you can run Cube Admin join and you get a cluster. But what it doesn't give you is an actual infrastructure layer. It assumes the infrastructure exists. It assumes network exists. It assumes you have a persistent volume. And then you can form a cluster. So it really operates on a different layer. Um, for those who don't know, Cube Admin is another SIG cluster lifecycle um, project. And I don't want to give the wrong idea. This is, a lot of this is by design. Kubernetes is supposed to solve things for containers. It, infrastructure is really out of scope right now. And I'll let you give you a minute to read that tweet by Kelsey from a while ago. Cool. Um, so this brings me back to my problem, that there is no foundation to build higher level tooling from. Um, you will have to re-implement the whole thing again and again and again, yet. So hi, my name is Karan. Um, I work for Google in the Cluster Lifecycle team, where our primary project right now is the open source Cluster API. That's me at my brother's wedding earlier this year. Um, and you should follow me on social. What I want to talk to you about, like I said, is Cluster API. It's a SIG Cluster Lifecycle sponsored project, completely open source. Um, which lets you manage infrastructure for a Kubernetes cluster in a very declarative way. One caveat though, a lot of this talk is using pre-alpha software. Uh, we are marching towards an alpha, probably Q2, end of Q2, early Q3. So what I show you today, what I talk to you about today, can and will change um, in the coming weeks. So what is Cluster API? Um, this is how we define it in our uh, KEP, the Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal. But let's break it down a little bit. Cluster API is a Kubernetes project to bring declarative. So what is declarative? Everything is in a YAML, everything is in a spec. Um, and I'll show you that now. This is how we define a cluster. We define the networking properties, the pod and the services uh, sitter ranges. We define provider config. This could include things like your password for uh, your vSphere lab, or um, you know, your uh, master, con not your master configuration, other networking configurations if you have any. And this is an example of a master machine I'm defining here. Again, if you notice, I've defined the properties of the machine, specifically the num CPU and the memory here. Um, and I've defined control plane version that I want there because this is a master. In a similar way, I can define nodes um, and we have support for machine sets right now, so you can really uh, take advantage of that and not have uh, duplicate machine specs. Second, it is a Kubernetes-style API. So if you know and love the Kubernetes restfulness, that's exactly what you get in Cluster API. 
We do the same, we use the same uh, API server, we use the same etcd. And third, it is an optional additive functionality. It's not part of core Kubernetes yet. Um, there are people who think it should be. There are people who think who sh it should not be part of core Kubernetes. I won't give my personal opinion here. And finally, it is Kubernetes. It really operates like Kubernetes does. Um, the name cluster API can imply that we're defining types and calling it a day. But really what we're doing is taking the common controllers, the common logic, and bundling that into something that we can distribute. And then some provider, some IS can write their provider logic, making it extensible. I'll show you this a little bit more, uh, uh, this in a little bit more detail in a, in a second. But I want to point out, all the last five slides, that's how Kubernetes does containers. That's how we want to do clusters. So this, this diagram is what we have been showing in our uh, cluster API decks to highlight how uh, really cluster API is a layered platform. From the bottom, we have our infrastructure layer. This would be your um, uh, cloud providers or your on-prem uh, provider. This could even be a Raspberry Pi, by the way. Um, the second layer is bootstrapping. Like I said, we are using kubeadmin for in-machine bootstrapping. And then finally, we have uh, Kubernetes. This is core Kubernetes. So if you just build up until Kubernetes layer, you already have the Kubernetes cluster. On top of that, we install our cluster API as an extension API server. This includes specs for cluster objects, machine objects, machine set, set objects, and machine deployments. And then finally, the right block in that uh, diagram is provider actuator. So this is the bit that I can write for GCE or I can write for AWS, and it's just making call out to the infrastructure to configure, say, a VM or a load balancer. It does not have to know anything about Kubernetes. The cluster API, and clus the cluster API comes with controllers that do uh, know about uh, the, the cluster it is controlling. On top, we have deployment tools and cluster automation. So people who are cluster administrators or uh, part of platforms teams uh, would make or build those or, or use those tools. Um, COPS, uh, Cubicorn, ClusterCuddle. ClusterCuddle is the tool uh, we are writing as part of Cluster API. I wanted to name it Cuddle with a K, like give me a cuddle, but it didn't. It got voted down. Um, Cubicorn has already started adopting the Cluster API as of last week, so that's really exciting. Um, for automation, we know like people write their own autoscalers, people write their own repair tools, they write their own upgrading tools. And so what Cluster API gives is a common interface where I don't need to know about the infrastructure itself or the provider itself. I just need to know my nodes and my machines. And finally, a scary diagram because it's a conference. Um, this is our uh, um, Kubernetes uh, cluster API diagram in our GitHub repo. Um, see if this pointer will work. Cool. So I want to point out that this line here is the divide between user space and cluster cloud provider state. Um, on top, we have the bootstrapping CLI. This would be the tools like COPS or cluster cuddle and things like that. When you, when you bootstrap a cluster, which I should do right now, what is going to happen is we're spinning up a local VM. It's a Kubernetes uh, a Minikube VM, which, which has the cluster API, these, these little boxes here. So we're installing the cluster API extension server, which is an aggregated API server. Um, we're installing our own etcd data store. We're installing all of our controllers. And then right in the controller is our machine actuator. This machine actuator, in my case, the command I ran, is actually spinning up, is actually making calls to vSphere. Um, people know what vSphere is? So vSphere is VMware's suite of um, uh, hypervisor and virtualization uh, software. Um, so once we start spinning up the bootstrapping machine, we register your master against it, and then that bootstrapping machine starts creating this user cluster. 
um, after this user cluster is created and we've installed the cluster API there, we'll copy over the etcd from local to that, which we call pivoting. And after that, the master machine will then create rest of the nodes. I know it sounds confusing, um, but what I would like to focus here on is that the user space on the far left could, be, could also be in the cloud. So you could imagine spinning up a cluster, uh, a GCE cluster in a VM that's running also on GCP. But wait a minute, it's just a command. Why can't you install it? Why can't you run it from inside a Kubernetes controller? So on the far left could be another Kubernetes cluster which reconciles the state in a way that creates the other cluster. So you can have a Kubernetes cluster managing a Kubernetes cluster. Um, what you can also do is have those clusters run across clouds. So I know a lot of banks are careful about what goes on prem and what goes in cloud. So in this case, they can really have a clean separation using a common interface and common tooling between what is on prem and what is in cloud. Um, and so, like I've been saying, we're trying to standardize the interface that uh, cluster operators have to interact with for managing their clusters. And I just want to show you what this actually means in real life, is that there's one tool and one command and one variable that users have to plug in, which is the controller specs. So in first case, I'm defining my controller for vSphere. In the second case, I'm defining controller for GCE. So this is the demo video, the backup I have, but um, maybe we can go here. So you can see in this demo that I started, we, we are using Terraform to bring up our cluster, and uh, we created our machine, and in our machine as part of the startup script, we're installing pure upstream Kubernetes. It's not a fork of Kubernetes. Uh, we are installing kubeadmin and running kube, kube, uh, kubeadmin. We're copying the uh, kubeconfig file over, and then we are waiting for Kubernetes to come up right here. And after that happens, we're trying to deploy the cluster API. Now this will take about four minutes, um, so what I wanna do is while that is happening, go to, this is our vSphere lab. I don't know if people can see this, but um, this is the VM that's being spun up. Uh, this is the master that's coming up. And I think this is extraordinary because we are starting with on-prem here. We're not saying we're cloud native. I think we have solutions for cloud native and it's easy, easy, easier than on-prem. And you can see that this lab we have is getting the VM. Um, because this will take some time, I already had a cluster created here with one master and one node. Um, okay, perfect, our master is created here. So let's just do a kubectl get nodes. Let me do that up there. So you can see I have one node running right now. And again, this is pure Kubernetes. There's no hacks, there's no forks. Um, I can also do kube, kube cuddle get machines to see the machine objects. Again, I had one node and one master. Um, what I can also do, we'll see if this actually works because the node is still coming up, is install a workload. So I'll take, um, I'm using my uh, kubectl to apply nginx. We created the deployment and we created the service. Um, and now we can get the deployment. Perfect, we have two replicas running of nginx. Um, so this is really showing you how it is actual Kubernetes and we ran internal tests on this uh, just two days ago and this passes all conformance tests, all 125 of them. Cool, so now we have our cluster and it's working. But guess what, there's a new Kubernetes release every three months, about every three months. Um, some organizations prefer to have uh, parity with the current version. Some will like to have delays because uh, they want it battle tested and bugs fixed. In that case, you do want to upgrade either three months or six months from now. But what we found was Kubernetes upgrades are difficult. How many people think Kubernetes upgrades are difficult? Let the camera show everyone raise their hands here. Um, and the reason why it's difficult 
is also very difficult to understand. So I want to break it down into three categories from left to right. We'll, we'll uh, talk about that. On the far left, we had node upgrades. So this is VMs that are running your workloads. In my case, the VM that's running Nginx here. They're relatively easy because all you have to do, really, is if you want to resize the VM, you take it out of rotation, install, uh, bring up a new VM, and attach it to your cluster. Easy-ish, right? The next one is control plane upgrades. So this is upgrading from Kubernetes version 1.10.1 to 1.10.2, for example. This is a little risky, especially in a single master configuration, uh, because for the duration of the upgrade, your control plane will be down. So that's something you will have to take into account. Uh, of note here is that while your control plane is down, you cannot schedule new workloads. Uh, you cannot take off, take out any workloads of uh, circulation, uh, but your existing workloads will keep running. And finally, the most difficult uh, upgrade is master VM upgrade. So this is things like patching, patching the OS running in your master VM. Um, this can be a little easier if you're running an HA and you have three masters behind a load balancer, uh, but you still need to be careful about um, taking that out of the load balancer configuration at the right time, uh, unmounting the disk at the right time, and mounting the disk back onto the new VM also at the right time. So what I'm getting at here is upgrading is very difficult. Um, at Google, while we are running GKE, we have learned a little bit of uh, upgrading here and there, um, as have many other organizations and people who manage their clusters. With Cluster API, we want to aggregate all of that knowledge and open it out to the community here. Because to be honest, all of these day two operations, including upgrading, don't really require codes that, code that, that's that different. Um, so what I want to do is talk about just control plane version, uh, control plane upgrades, because these will be on the relative scale a little harder, a little risky, and a little more frequent. Um, if you go to your uh, Kubernetes cluster, SSH into your master, and ls that path, etsy Kubernetes manifest, you'll see four files there, generally. Uh, if you notice the three that are um, highlighted there, you'll see that that's my Kubernetes control plane. Those three files, the API server, controller manager, and the scheduler, those are the three components that form my control plane. So that gives, you an, that gives you a hint that maybe these three files are telling something what to run as the control plane. Um, what's really in those files are just, are just YAML specs of pods that define what to run. Um, they include all the flags, all of the networking, the binary and the image to run. Um, but these are special types of pods. They're run and read by the kubelet rather than the scheduler. Um, so they're called static pods. So what, what I want to do now is show you a little bit of the upgrade prototype I had. Um, it may or may not work. In our cluster that's running right now, I will do uh, oops. Let's get our machines. I have my master machine here. Okay, so what I will do is run this one command. Sorry. I'm using the wrong cube config because I have backups and stuff. Hopefully that works. Okay, perfect. So you can see the cluster we just created is running those three components, and those three com images are tagged version 1.10.1. Um, what I can do now is let's see if this will actually work. Edit my machine. Nope. D1. Test one. And we'll go to our. So you can see I have control plane version defined here. I will bump it up from 1101 to 1102. And we'll hope that this works. Um, I would like to talk about how this will actually work now. Um, we use kubeadmin also for upgrades. 
So effectively what's happening is the machinery is executing that command on top, which is saying, hey, cube admin, upgrade me to ver version 110.2. And what happens is a sequence of very complicated steps, but we can distill it into five of these five steps here. First is pre-flight checks. So this would be validations like, can the cube admin version actually upgrade me to the desired version? Um, for example, cube admin 1.8 will not upgrade you to Kubernetes 1.10. The second is pre-pulling images. And this is, I would argue, the most important step because uh, by pre-pulling all of the images, we're reducing the latency of the actual upgrade. Um, if you sequence them out, then you're downloading image, applying it, downloading, applying, and that's, that can uh, take your control plane down for a long time. The third is we're backing up the existing manifest. So the three files we saw, it will back up these in a temp file somewhere or a temp directory somewhere. And then it will apply the new files onto the same uh, path. The kubelet will see that change, restart the pods, and then uh, cube admin it will watch for the change. If that, hap if that works, great, we're, we're done. We can clean up the backups. If it doesn't, it will apply the backup manifests again. So let's see if this actually worked in our case. And you can see our control plane is now running 1.10.2. So again, I, wanna, I, wanna, I really wanna tell you this, that this is upgrading Kubernetes control plane on vSphere, running in our lab in Google Mountain View somewhere. Um, I, think, I think it's something spectacular that has not been done um, uh, this well before. Cool, that was my backup video. Um, so now some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, doesn't Terraform do this? Doesn't Terraform manage my infrastructure for me? And the answer is yes, it does manage infrastructure for you, but it doesn't manage a cluster for you. So under the hood, the demo I showed you was using Terraform. We were defining Terraform HCL uh, config files. Uh, we were using Terraform for delet deletion of the VMs. But Terraform does not know about Kubernetes. It does not speak Kubernetes. It does not have an API server. And what we are really trying to do is make Kubernetes-like interface for cluster management. Cool, so how does it fit in with the multi-cloud strategy and the multi-cloud vision that we have in the SIG? Um, what I've been talking to you about is very, uh, is already existing in the repo or will, will exist very soon. But what if you had requirements of uh, maybe some of your workloads living in the cloud, some living on-prem, but then your operators will need to know both of those environments well enough. They'll need to learn tooling for both of those environments. They'll need to train on troubleshooting for both of those environments. Um, or maybe you're running on-prem, but you're low on capacity and you get a lot of traffic from Hacker News and you could burst into cloud. That would be cool. Uh, or maybe cloud is your uh, disaster recovery scenario. Maybe you run on-prem and if someone trips over a wire, you switch over into cloud. I did have a demo for this, but I don't think I have the time for that right now. Um, so I'll just talk to you about um, what we have been thinking about. Because we're standardizing the interface for uh, our cluster, we could build some tooling that takes cluster A living uh, on-prem in vSphere and represent that as cluster B living in GCE. And right now we have to do this manually, but it would not be difficult to do this in an automated way once we abstract away the um, common bits um, more and more. Uh, what, I, what I have in this diagram is distilling of a cluster in three categories. One is infrastructure, Kubernetes, and then workloads. We can use cluster API to take your infrastructure and Kubernetes that's installed on your existing cluster onto a different uh, cluster. This could reach into uh, cloud boundaries. For, uh, for workloads, we can use something like Heptio Arc to back up our workloads on one cloud or one environment and restore it on a different environment. So you can imagine uh, possibilities are endless. The tooling you'll, you can build is endless, but the, the benefit is that it's standard tooling. You're jumping from environments, you're not jumping from tools. Um, so it's, 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 it's a little bit more efficient for uh, your organization. Um, so if all of this sounds good to you, um, I have dropped the link to the repo right there. 
which is the sigs.kates.io slash cluster API. We have a lot of bugs. We're working on alpha. Um, if you're curious, if you have thoughts, if you have ideas, uh, we're always open to them. Um, I also have a landing page, the first link there with the slides and the demo videos um, and addendums if I have to add any. Talk to me later if you need to. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, Karen.